The first time the workers at what was then the Republic Windows and Doors factory in Chicago were laid off by their factory owner, they occupied their factory. The second time they were laid off by their owner, they decided to take over and become their own boss. This May, those workers are now the happy worker owners of New Era Windows, which is opening for business as we speak. We decided to make a co-op because we were tired of our life being in someone else's hand. Uh, at Republic, they had walked away from our job. Then Sirius had bought the company. They had walked away from our job and we hadn't walked away. So we had found out about the cooperative and we started pursuing it. And lo and behold, here we are today. To start with buy, buying windows from uh, New Era Windows as now, uh, we're taking orders, we're uh, ready to run our production, and we hope to have 100% of this factory running in the, in the future, in the future months. The United Electrical Workers have been a big part of this story. So has the working world. Brendan Martin is with us from Working World. It came onto my radar when it came onto most people's. It, it was on the nightly news all of a sudden, and I also was getting a lot of emails from different activist groups that I had known who knew about the work I was doing with... Uh, factories in Argentina. And um, it did remind me a lot of Argentina. You saw this incredible crisis, um, all these you know, factories being closed. We were in a financial crisis just like Argentina. Um, people felt like there was no option. And I saw that factory. And of course, what came to my mind was Argentina, the idea that the workers could take it over and run it. And what are some of the obstacles that they've faced? Because this has been a really long time. People who thought, OK, uh, they're going to start selling windows now. Right. Uh, it's been about a year of a wait. The first obstacle is they weren't even being allowed to the bargaining table for, to try to buy the factory. And that was the first public fight you saw. And then they won that right to, to bid on the factory. And then people didn't hear anything for a while, uh, partly because there was a non-disclosure agreement that had to be signed, et cetera, um, and partly because we weren't sure what to say to the press. We didn't know when it would open. But, so it took about three months to negotiate that contract. Um, this is all, you know, white knuckle, all the workers, you know, meeting every day in the, un in the union hall um, to figuring out, you know, how to go e every step. I mean, every day we were there for hours going through contracts. And, um, and then you come to September, and then people might not realize this, they actually, actually had to dismantle their factory. Mm -hmm. they didn't, they're not in the same factory. So it wasn't a question just, okay, we'll move in and start running it. They had to dismantle the factory. They had to move the entire factory. We had to unfortunately wait about four months for the new landlord to fulfill their promised uh, tenant improvements. And then finally, about two and a half, three months ago, the workers were able to start rebuilding their new factory. There have been times that we wasn't sure if we were going to be able to, to get New Era off the ground because um, where well, you have to get investors. So, you know, we don't, we don't have like a lot of people just knocking our door down to loan us money. We was very fortunate to meet and to get familiar with the working world uh, because they believed in us and they have been uh, very supportive of us morally and financially, which is what is needed. When they closed, we feel like uh, it was the end of our lives after eight years working in one place and you feel like it's your home. But when they closed, you realize like, we are not nobody. Some people, they decide to close the factories because they, they don't, don't make the, the money they, they expect, even though they make profit, but they, don't, they prefer to make more and more and more money each time, and they close the factory for that reason. And, and uh, at this point, I feel most confidential, most better, because we once just made money to uh, make our kids going to college and have a better life, and show the world that it's, I know it's a hope in this country and it's a better alternatives. And being owner of own company is, uh, to me, is amazing. And we have my, my co-workers working together and creating jobs with the community around this city. And I would like to uh, spread that idea around the United States. The workers that are now, uh, today, opening the new era factory in Chicago have themselves put in an enormous amount of work oh, yeah. into 
learning and training and coming to understand how this uh, how this could happen. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell us about about that process and the relationships that some of these people have built? I don't want to make it sound if things are black and white and it's perfection, but it's definitely been nothing shy of extraordinary. All those obstacles I talked about, like you know, every bend we try to get insurance or land or you know landlord, and they would bulk it at the co-op. The only reason we've been able to persevere and get it done in only a year is because of the extraordinary potential that the cooperative has unlocked. Us opening up this plant, we we have learned that we are so much more than what we thought that we were. Because in opening up this plant, we have done our own electrical work, we've done the plumbing work, and all we thought we were was just window makers. <laughs> <laughs> the unbelievable potential that's been unlocked, I, I really can't overstate that. And, and I don't even know if it's going to work. We have to remember that even as an excited activist. It still is a long way to go, even though it's opening its doors now. We all have to be behind it. But, you know, I, if this were looked at by a normal investment institution, they would have assumed two to five million dollars to open a business like this. It's been less than a million dollars, and the only reason is because that other three to five million in value has been brought by the workers. Talk about how the equipment got moved. So the factory that they were in, they had to leave. It was crazy expensive. It was a foolish business decision, somewhat born on corruption of, there was no reason for it to be in that part of Chicago. They wanted $13 a square foot. We found a place for $4 a square foot. Easy decision for the workers to make. Um, but you had to move it all. It was an incredible amount of stuff to move. It turned out to be 80 uh, tractor trailers full of stuff. And we had a very little time to move before uh, the workers started to get uh, fined for it. And so we went to professional movers, and they told us it was about 40 truckloads, half of what it would be. And they told us it would be what turned out to be over $100,000 it would have amounted to. Um, the workers said, well, forget that. And they moved it themselves. Um, they moved it twice the speed the professionals said they'd move it. Instead of four truckloads a day, they moved eight. And they moved it for $18,000. And that type of um, they, they weren't movers. This isn't what people did, but they all banded together. They organized themselves. They worked it out. You know, I was, was good exercise for a couple of days there, or a month or two. Um, you know, and everyone loaded trucks, unloaded them. We organized having I mean, people in one end, people in the other end. You know, how to how to make the the trucks move most efficiently, et cetera. And it was just like that type of flowering of potential that's just locked out of our normal system. Uh, to me, was staggering. And those workers. I don't know whether we've mentioned it's predominantly immigrants, people of color. Um, there's an aspect of that story, that, that part of this story that I think is worth pointing out too, uh, that these are people who are bringing jobs to a community, people who are often told that they're taking jobs from mm -hmm. other folks. Absolutely. Yeah, it's 100% owned by people of color. Uh, there's African American and mostly Mexican, the rest of it is Hispanic in general, but the Mexicans have a huge majority locally. The food's really good in the factory. Um, and without a doubt, I mean, you know, if you think about the way some like Mitt Romney talked about the takers in this country, he was directing his gaze at the people who are now, who took a factory that's going to be obliterated, rebuilt it and by themselves, um, and created jobs for people and created wealth for this country. So, you know, and that, that potential that's in immigrants, that's in people who have been traditionally marginalized, um, that's what, I mean, I see that in, in workers across the country who are marginalized, who are who are paid wages like this, who are considered to be job takers. So, you know, the way that we're flipping things on its head and, and thinking about workers as potential rather than as costs uh, to be eliminated, um, I think also makes us look differently at, at what we think about what immigrants bring um, and rather than take. Um, and, and New Era is a shining example of that. Talk about the crisis and what role it's played. Do you think this would have happened if it hadn't been for the financial crash of 2008? I mean, I'd like to think that the crisis of 2008 illustrated the huge uh, fractures in our financial system and the huge abuses that it heaps on the rest of the country. And that'll, that, that's enough to at least have people experiment in things like worker control, in capital subordinate to workers like, uh, like the bank we run, that sort of thing. Now, that first owner from what was then Republic Windows and Doors hasn't gone away. He's still somewhere around. Uh, now he has competition. Um, what's the prospect like for the new factory? And what can people do if they want to help the new era side of this fight? Yeah, um, the former owner, the one who was being sued by, uh, et cetera, by the, by the government and one who doesn't have such a great reputation, is still around. He didn't actually go bankrupt. They opened up a new factory and has been running it. And he's definitely been haunting around the factory now, seeing what kind of place he can poke at, calls me 10 times a day sometimes, calls the workers 10 times a day, for real. 
and without a doubt it's going to be hard to break into that market. Now there should be plenty of space in the market. The workers have a really low overhead. They should be able to survive on a tiny percentage of the market. It's really not the competition, but that's obviously what this former owner sees them as. Um, and they're small. They don't have all the inside connections. They don't have all the backroom buddies. They're a company of only 20 people right now. So without a doubt, now more than ever, they need the community to come to them. People who think this is the kind of production we want to support, um, not people getting paid $8 an hour through temp agencies to do this work. You know, we're a country that was built on manufacturing. They're supposed to be middle class jobs. If you can provide a window at a price that's competitive, which they can, and, and support middle class jobs, that's what we want to support in the United States. This job and this factory, it represents a lot of hope and determination because it shows my grandkids and my children that with hard work, determination, that you can make it, that you don't necessarily have to just be at the other end of the stick, that you can take control of your life.